This week we're finishing it up with the Savior. The Savior. Who would have guessed as you go through all the S's? Savior is the last one. So what does that mean that he's our Savior? Can anyone tell me like a little bit about that? When I say Savior, and some of you might give me church answers and and all that, but when you think of that word, show of hands, raise your hand because I'll get all confused if I hear a bunch of voices, but show of hands if when I say the word Savior, what is it that you think about when I say the word Savior? John. Redeemer, okay, yeah. Oh, pay to death that you, debt that you can't pay, love it, yeah. Someone who saves people, yeah. Someone, uh, that doesn't sound weird, yeah. Someone that you can lean on, love it in your time of need, yeah. Someone that women like, is that what you said? Wow, okay. I, that's, that's a new one. <laughs> sure. Throw it in there. All right. Throw that one in the Webster's Dictionary. All right. Uh, hold on. Hey, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Hey, hold up, hold up. Got another one. Sienna. Hey, hey, hold on, hold on. Guys, you can hold, you can hold it. You guys can hold it. I believe in you guys. Okay, yes. Someone who saved this from death and their sin. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. When you see this word... And we're here, we're at church talking about Jesus and stuff, right? Sometimes we're like, all right, cool, I already know that. How many of you does this actually mean something to you? You don't have to raise it, just think about it. How many does this actually mean something to you? Now, a couple of weeks ago, in our first week of this, we talked about servant, and we talked about the greatest of all time. Do you guys remember this? And on the screen, we had you guys voting who's the greatest of all time for things. And then at the last, one of the last ones, we did Marvel and DC. And we talk about superheroes, and we talk about greatest of all time. A savior, yeah, it's someone that people think about that comes in and saves the day. And they're willing to risk their life. They're willing to risk the, whatever it takes to come and save the day. But the cool thing about Jesus is uh, he thought of you before you're born. He came, he saves you. No matter what the cost was, he came for you. No matter what you're doing right now, he came for you, not just to save you, but to save the entire world. And can you imagine if you were crossing the street and there was a car that was coming at you? And someone jumps in front of you, they grab you, they pull you off to the side, they save your life. And this is sometimes what we could do is this. Oh, cool. And you keep going. Like it didn't matter. Like, okay, cool. That's sometimes how people respond to Jesus. He came to save us, not just from death, but he saved us from our sins so that we can even have a relationship with him. And to some, it doesn't even mean anything. It's as though someone came and saved your life, and we don't even acknowledge it. Now, how would you feel if you went and you saved someone's life, and no one even said thank you or acknowledged it? It'd be sad. You'd be like, wow, I'm never doing that again. But Christ came to die once and for all for all of us, and you have a choice to make of what you want to do with that news. So what I want you to do is open up your Bibles and turn to Isaiah 11. Ooh, Isaiah. Let's see. God bless you. Isaiah chapter 11, that's the Old Testament. If you kind of go through like, kind of halfway through your Bible, you'll find Isaiah. You'll see Isaiah, then Jeremiah. You'll see Isaiah chapter 11. And if you're taking notes, you can also just write down Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 12. Those three kind of go all together. But we're just going to look at one verse right now in Isaiah 11. We're going to go over multiple verses, but Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Do you guys know what the word prophecy means? Does anyone know what that, what that word means, prophecy? Yeah, just a couple of you. Yeah, what is it, Logan? Okay, foretelling of future events. Okay, what were you going to say? A promise. Oh, that's cool. I like that. If you, like, put those together, that's really cool. Okay, so this was uh, someone that the Lord used to speak through to tell just what you said. It's a promise in the upcoming event. The Bible, there's a lot of prophecies in the Bible. 
A lot of them have happened, and there's still some that are going to happen. And this one right here is really interesting. This tells us about the Savior that was going to come, but not only that, where he was going to come from, which lineage, where his line was going to be from. So check this out. It says this in Isaiah 11, verse 1. It says, Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Now, does anyone know who Jesse is in the Bible? Does anyone know? You guys ever hear the name? It's not from Full House. No, it's not from Full House. Okay, you two are like on it today. Not bad, but Jesse, uh, you know, you usually give like really good theology ones, which is good, but let's let Logan have a chance right here. Not saying you don't, Logan, but go ahead. Awesome, the father of, you guys know King David in the Bible? Does anyone know what he was before he was king? What his position was, what he did, Sienna? He was a shepherd. What does his dad do? Who is his dad? Like you just said, his, his dad's name's Jesse. Does anyone know what he was before? Anyone know? What's that? The father of David? Yeah, father of David, yeah. That's one. He would, do you think he had a lot of money or do you think he didn't have a lot of money? He didn't have a lot of money? He was poor. He, had a, he, was, a, he was a farmer. He was a shepherd. And it's interesting because it says from the stump of Jesse. It doesn't say King David. It doesn't say David in here. Why do you think that is? Well, it's going to say where the Savior is going to come from, from this lineage of David. But it says the word Jesse. Why? Because it's humble beginnings. When Christ came into the world, when he steps into the scene in this barn, in this nativity section of a feeding trough, by the time it got down to Joseph, by the time it got down to Mary, they weren't these royalty people anymore. They were humble beginnings. They were poor and they were humble beginnings of where the Savior came from. So here he comes coming out, and he's here, he came, and now what I want you to do is check out, as he's here, what was his purpose of being here. Go to 1 Peter. That's to the right of your Bible. Go all the way to the right. It's towards the back of your Bible. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to look at Verse 24, I want you to know what he came, what he came to do, why he did it, and sometimes, like I said, we could just not pay any attention to it, we forget what he's done for us, we forget what really this season is about, but it should be the rest of 364 days. It's not just Christmas, this whole entire Bible is Christmas from the Garden of Eden, they've been talking about the coming Messiah, the birth of this Messiah, all the way through Revelation. This whole thing is about Christ. So we should look at it the more than just a month. But it says in verse 24, he himself, talking about Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree. Now I want you to see that it talked about a stump from Jesse, which is a tree. Now it's talking about a tree. And most of the time when we think of Christmas, we think of Christmas trees. But look at what this tree represents. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. And then check this out. By his wounds, you have been healed. So he bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. I have a question. What is righteousness? It's a big Christianese word and you hear this word righteousness. Yeah, what do you think it is? Stuff that's right. Okay, God making something right. Okay, anyone else have a guess? When it says live for righteousness, yes. To be right with God. Okay, anyone else? Yeah. Okay, so when it says that we might live for righteousness, here's this. What were we living for before? Huh? What was that? Our sinful desires for ourselves. Okay, which we still do sometimes, but it says, by, your, by his wounds you have been healed. What have we been healed from? We've been healed from sin. How does that, what does that even mean? Healed from sin. Now, does everyone in here sin? Have you ever sinned before? Or is it just me? Anyone in here ever sinned before? Okay, there's a lot of times where you'll talk about Jesus with people, you'll share the gospel with people, and they have a hard time with that word. We'll say, I'm not a sinner. That guy's a sinner over there. Who are you to judge? You can't tell me I'm a sinner. But the Bible tells us each and every one of us have sinned. And maybe you've heard me say this a million times. You've heard other pastors say this, other youth leaders, that sin is this archery term where you got a bullseye over there and I take my arrow back and I shoot the bullseye. 
And if I miss the bullseye, it's called a sin. It means I've missed perfection. I missed the mark. And each and every one of us in here, we miss this mark of perfection. We all mess up. And we all know this because some of us all say to our parents, well, no one's perfect, mom and dad. Not perfect. We all mess up. Now, in the very beginning, when God created everything, it was, it was perfect, it was very good, and then sin came into the world. And what happens is God actually can't be around that. He can't be around sin. He can't not have that because God is righteous, he's pure, he's good. He cannot be around that. And now there's a curse that's upon the world. There's a curse that's on the animals, curse that's on the women, curse that's on the men. Now there's a curse. And with that curse comes payment that we have, and it's death. Did you guys know we weren't supposed to die at first? That didn't come until sin came into the world. Now, each and every one of us in here, what we have in common, we're gonna die. So just when you think of a savior, when you think of a hero that comes in to save the day, Christ did that. We're gonna die, and because we got sin, well, when we die, that means that there's an afterlife. Heaven's a real place, hell is a real place. One was created for the devil and the demons, one was created to have a relationship with God, but guess what, now that we sin, we don't have that relationship. And so God loves you so much, he's like, listen, I'm, I, I'm gonna send my son down there to die for them. We've always been plan A. It was never a mistake or, oh man, they sinned, now what do I do? He always had you on his mind. It says, by his wounds, you have been healed. See, what we talked about with some of these messages is we talked about a guy with leprosy. Do you guys remember that? We talked about a, a little boy that was dead in a coffin. And Christ, when he came on this earth, he did things that no one else could do. He flipped this whole world upside down and it got people upset with him. What did he do? He touched someone that was a leper. You don't do that. He touched the coffin. You don't touch dead things. He's able to reach and heal things that had no cure, just like their sin. If I, I can't tell you to go to Walgreens and go get a cure for sin, there is no cure for sin except Jesus. That is the cure for sin. So what I want you to do, because uh, we're in Arizona, I'm gonna throw this picture on here of the Grand Canyon. You guys ever been to the Grand Canyon before? You guys ever been to the Grand Canyon? Okay, can you throw that, that picture up there? Here's uh, one of the angles of the Grand Canyon, okay? I want you guys to get this. I want you to picture this. I want you to remember this. Is Imagine that you're on one side. All of you, if I lined all of you up, every single, even the leaders, if I lined all of us up, on this side of this canyon, and I would say this, and imagine, now this isn't real, so don't say, oh my goodness, Pastor Matt said this, so this is how it is, this isn't how it works, but imagine that side's heaven, okay? This is us on earth, and that's how you get to heaven. You gotta make it across. And so I want you to see that for all of you that's like, I'm an athlete, I'm super good. Is there anything you're gonna do to jump that at all? There's nothing that you can do to get to the other side. No matter how good you are, you cannot get to the other side. No matter how much you work out, you cannot get to the other side. Even if you try to go to the gym every single day and you guys try to jump, you cannot do it on your own. This is what our life is like before Christ. And when you try to be good enough on your own, you're trying to reach God on your own. You're trying to do it by your own works. You're gonna plummet. And this is our fate before Christ, is we're gonna live separate from him. There's this division that's between us and God because we have sin in our lives. And this is what God saw. He saw that you got sin. He saw that I got sin. And he wants a relationship with you. So he sent the son. Go go to the next one, David. He sent the son on this cross. And that cross is now the bridge between you and the Lord. So when Christ came and died on that cross, he was the payment for our sins. He took all of our sins, the ones that we've done, the ones that you're doing, the ones that you're gonna do, he put them on the cross. And now if you just believe in your heart that he's Lord and declare with your mouth that God rose him from the dead, you are saved. And there's this huge word that we talked about last week. Not a lot of people share this word anymore. Does anyone remember what it starts with? It starts with an R. Do you remember what this word is? Huh? Repent. Does anyone know what that means? We've shared this before. Repentance. What's repentance? Yeah, good. Turn away from your sins, okay? So come here. Come here, Brody. Okay? This is what repentance is. No, no, Brody, Brody, Brody. You can, no, bro, uh, Brody. This is what repentance is. This, is. this is me before Christ. I'm in my sins. I'm walking one way. Go ahead. And then I repent, which means I turn around, and I go the other direction. That's repentance. Have a seat. Give him a hand. That was phenomenal. 
before, before Christ, I'm living in my sin. I'm living in selfish desires. I'm living in my pride. I'm living in a certain lifestyle that is displeasing to the Lord. And when I give my life to the Lord, now I see, well, my goodness, that's wrong. And I want to repent. I want to turn away from that, go a different direction. And I see that there's nothing I could do to earn God's love. There's nothing I can do to earn my way to heaven except Christ came to do what I couldn't do. He got whipped for me, beaten for me. He died for me. All of our sin was on that cross. I want you to imagine all those wounds that he took from all those lashings that he had, the bleeding that he had, the nails that, that, we, that he had. And I pointed back there because there's a huge replica um, of what they looked like. And he did that for you. And it says, by his wounds, we are healed. You're not just healed physically. That's not healed physically. It's talking about from your sin and an eternal death. That when you give your life to him, you are healed from this incurable thing called sin that he came to save you from. And real quick, I want you to go back to Isaiah. And I want you just to listen to this in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. This whole chapter is talking about Christ and what he came to do and how he did it and who he is as our Savior. It says this in Isaiah 53. I'm going to start in verse 4. You can read the other three to it, but verse 4. Yet he himself, talking about Christ, bore our sickness and carried our pain. But we, in turn, regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our iniquities, that's our sin. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. Isn't that funny? It's interesting. It's the same thing that we just read. By his wounds, we're healed. It's quoting this. Verse 6, we all went away astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity or the sins of us all. It says all of us have sinned. All of us have turned away. We've all gone our own path, so none of us in here are good enough. None of us in here could ever be good enough. It's not like, oh my goodness, I see this person, that they've just stuck it out. They're doing great. If I could do everything on my own, I wouldn't need Jesus. But because I've messed up, I've gone astray, I need Jesus. In verse seven, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep silent before her shearers. He did not open his mouth. At any point, Christ could have came down from that cross if he wanted to. He could have just said the words and the Roman guards could have fallen down. He could have asked his angels to come down. They could have came down. He didn't say a word because he said, you're worth it. And then it says this in verse eight. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with a rich man at his death because he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed. He will prolong his days. And by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. After his anguish, He will see light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. I want you guys to know that as he came here, he carried your sin. And sometimes when we accept him, we have a hard time believing that and knowing that he came and died for you. And we sometimes still walk with this guilt as if uh, he didn't die for me or he didn't save me. Yes, he did. He came to die for you. He carried your sins on that cross. And when he died, not only that, He rose again, defeating those things so that we can walk in freedom, walk knowing that we can have a relationship with him, and walk knowing that when you give your life to him, you are saved and can look forward to the promise of being with him forever. So we're gonna dive into this more in your small groups, and we're gonna pray, and we're gonna have a great Christmas. And so let's pray. Lord, thank you for all you do. Thank you for not just saving us from sin, but saving us for a relationship with you. So thank you that through your son, Jesus, we can have a relationship with you. We're free from our sin. We're free from the power that that has over us and an eternity away from you. So Lord, continue to work in and through us. 
Help us to live in a manner that when we walk in this way with you, people see you and they see there's something different in our lives. And let that be you. Thank you for these students that are here, Lord. Help them to know what you've done for them and to say yes to you. And help these small groups to just really uh, be a blessing to them. And let this time be be great for the, the students and leaders before break. We love you, Lord, and praise you in your name. Amen.